Welcome to the Alpha Pickleball Podcast, where we slice through the noise to bring you the juiciest insights, strategies, and stories from the dynamic world of pickleball. Join us as we serve up engaging conversations with top players, coaches, and enthusiasts, giving you an ace perspective on all things pickleball. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just stepping onto the court, get ready for a volley of knowledge that'll elevate your game to alpha levels. Let the rallies begin. All right, welcome again to the show. I'm your host, Tats, and I'm really excited to have Matthias Johansson here. Thank you, thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Yeah. So I love that background screen you have, Golden Gate Bridge. Um, I went to school there for a bit. Um, wonderful. Yeah, I know, right? I mean, that's uh, me not being good at technology. I happened to pop up. I say, hey, I stay with it. So why not? <laughs> now, I read somewhere in your background, you you were born in Sweden, which I mean, Ed Berg was my tennis idol. So, I mean, you know, and uh, you you um, played racquetball, badminton and tennis. Is that true? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, halfway, right? So in, in school, during high school years, it was, uh, you know, indoor gyms there. We did play a lot of uh, badminton there. The school championship, right? A lot of uh, table tennis, ping pong as well. And then when I got to college, actually, the racquetball was big in on the East Coast. So that's where I stopped playing that a little bit. But racquetball was not too serious. And neither was really the other one compared to tennis. That's really, uh, you know, what I was uh, going after. Yeah. So I said, it says that you had a, a degree in tennis and acting. How does that fit in? Acting? Yeah. No, I don't think I have any d degree in acting. I, I, I got I mean, it. Maybe I maybe I read it wrong. So you got a degree in tennis. So. Yes, yeah, so it's the uh, the PTR. Uh, they have different levels, and when you go through all the steps, then you can apply for getting the masters of tennis in uh, through PTR. It's a two year course. Uh, coursework, uh, 20 different courses. So, and I did that one. So why not? Yeah. So basically, um, I mean, as a, as a player, I mean, what, what were your goals? Um, what, you know, what were you trying to achieve? Uh, you know, tennis wise, I, I felt like I, for whatever reason, I really never really fully reach my potential. I had a lot of injuries, a lot of uh, illness as when I was younger. So, and growing up in that stage, we had, uh, you know, a lot of good players in Sweden during that time. So I played against a lot of them, uh, but obviously they were better. So I was the next level down and, uh, you know, so it never really got where I wanted, as far as I wanted with tennis. You know, the lower level professional, when you see your friends, you know, playing the high level professional, it it's, uh, uh, wasn't as fulfilling for me as it probably was for them. Got it. And uh, so coaching kind of became your life? Yes, I mean, in one way, I mean, it kind of I didn't plan on it. I grad, you know, I went to school and uh, got a scholarship here for tennis. And when I graduated, uh, my athletic director asked me literally uh, the week after and asked if I could be the head coach for next year. And uh, I, his only criteria was you got to stay three years to stabilize the program as far as coaching goes. And I said, hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can do that and end up being 19 years at that place and now another nine at the uh, user Riverside. So I've been, yeah, so basically, you know, become my profession. I didn't expect it to be, I didn't plan on it, but, you know, being a, around young people uh, my whole life, I never graduated. I'm still on a school campus, right? So it's, it's fun. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that you took uh, tennis in your older years a bit more serious than many um you know what motivated you to do that well i think you know when 
when I started, you know, and not started, but, you know, up to 32, 33 years old, I still played the future tournaments around uh, while I was coaching at one university. And after that, I had a back issue, so I didn't play for 13, 14 years. And then, so, but, you know, it's, I felt like if a coach can play and the players know he can play, it brings a little bit more value and what he, what he says behind it. But after, you know, for my first university where I went to, you know, all the players knew I, I knew how to play and I was pretty decent in it. But then when 12, 13 years passed by and I haven't played anything, uh, you know, I felt like, oh, the, now it's a Division One school here. Uh, they, what would my players think? Does, does this old guy even know anything? So that's really how I started playing again. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. I started with the lower guys on lineup, started moving up and... Uh, after that, say, hey, you know, why don't you play the more or less the ITF tournaments? They have, you know, a lot of uh, being world ranking and see how far you can go. I said, hmm, let me think about it. So and that's why I did. And I've become very, very serious about it. <laughs> and perfect. And from that, I think you, you're you gunning for that uh, world number one in your category. And then how did you discover pickleball? Yeah, so yeah, as, as you said, I was aiming for it and I was pretty good on track to to reach pretty far up. I ended up being 16 at that time and I had a couple of tournaments that didn't count it uh, yet that I was planning on going to the world championship. If I did decent there, I would climb a lot of spots and then COVID hit. And so they canceled everything. And at that time, you know, I was very serious about tennis. I... I was bombed out about it, and a friend then uh, told me, let's go play pickleball, and I denied the, the whole thing for a couple of times. I, I don't even know, like the name of it. It, it seems silly. Uh, no interest. Typical tennis attitude, right? Tennis guy's attitude. And all of a sudden, you know, he dragged me on there. And from the first time, I just uh, loved it. I just loved the simple to to learn or, or you can everybody can do it decently the first time but pretty hard to and complex to master and that's kind of what it triggered my mind about it so i went back to my wife and said hey we, we have nothing else to do let's play some pickleball and she was like me the first couple of times no i don't want to do it but sooner or later we uh like a month later we stopped playing and uh, we have both been playing ever since so it, it's it's a good story couldn't be happier with my decision it's sad that COVID hit right for many people, but you know I would never have found uh, pickleball without COVID. I don't think. Yeah, and you went. You know, although you didn't reach the the number one goal in tennis, you had you've reached your pickleball number one goal. Tell me about that journey. Yeah, so uh, I had you know in the beginning I had a journey from thousand to one in tennis and see how far I could climb up on it. You know so and it stopped at one time. So then when I started playing uh, pickleball, I decided to try the same goal even if it don't have necessarily thousand of of players in the senior pros. Uh, but that was my journey, and I just felt like singles was something that fitted my style of of play and the creativity in my mind to do it. So um, you know. I looked at uh, in my first tournament, I looked at Paul Allen, Mercha, Scott Moore, and, uh, you know, they were good players. And I think, but maybe if I train, you know, I can have a shot at those guys, you know, because it's kind of smaller court, you know, need to get the ball in the court, go to the net, figure stuff out. Uh, let's see what happens. And, uh, yeah, it has been a journey ever since. So, been a, a, a great couple of years, that's for sure. Yeah. So this, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about the doubles transition from tennis, but I know people, I know a lot of people don't talk about the singles. They say a lot of it's similar, but there are differences. Walk me through the differences. Yeah, I think, you know, just because you've been a good tennis player doesn't mean necessarily that you will be a big, you know, good singles players. Um because the, the swinging pattern, first of all, it, you need to shorten down your swing so much. And the ball doesn't come to you. You have to really step into the ball and take it at the uh, highest point, try to do that. And then that's the next game of hitting decent, hard shot, deep balls 
and still getting over that net and still create this the top spin on it, it takes some time to adjust to. And obviously the whole tennis is important to have deep shot, but pickleball is super important to have deep, deep shot. And you know, tennis is deep shot is maybe four feet inside the baseline, but pickleball is one foot inside the baseline, right? So it's a lot of differences there, but yes, in singles, the tennis player have a better chance to be good at pickleball compared to a tennis player getting good in doubles in pickleball. And obviously, I'm one person that has noticed that in doubles, it takes a lot more time. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a completely different game compared to singles. Yeah, I mean, you know, I haven't tried to play pickleball singles a lot, but um I, I feel like the margin of error is very little. When I saw Agassi and those players play, they were always hitting five to six feet over the net, very hard. But I, I you know, pickleball feels like they're just, you know, going at it and just, you know, the, the margins are so small. Yes, it is. And I, I think that's, if you have, my style was always in tennis, a little bit of the safety players maneuver the player and not doing mistakes so that is you know kind of i think why that fits pickleball so good for me because i always had that mindset that i really don't want to miss uh and you know pickleball is a game of mistakes and not the game of winners and i think that's what translates so good to for me my personal mind how pickleball should be played so you're absolutely right you know those margins uh, the fascinating part is you can play your, your best game ever and in one match and five minutes later, those margins, you know, it clips the tape every time and, and you're struggling, right? So yeah. it is very, very small margins and the games of runs as well. You know, I mean, that a guy is hot for five, six points, you know, all of a sudden you're down to six zero. And, and it's a, yeah, much more slimmer uh, margins to, from success to failure in, in pickleball. Yeah, but if it feels like you've discovered the balance, because obviously, you know, like you said, it's a game of mistakes. So you said a good shot in pickleball is a foot from a line versus four feet from a line. I mean, how do you view the other areas? Like when you're from the baseline, what's a good margin, right? In tennis, it's well discussed on how high you should hit over the net. Um but for you, what, 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 you know, with dinks and other shots, what, how do you address margin of error? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, you know, from the baseline too, I mean, I think it really, it's two components there. You know, one is that too many pickable players, when they get into the baseline relics, they stay a little bit too far back. So they let the ball drop down. So if, me on my part is I'm not taking the ball a little bit early and start moving them around and they are stretching and reaching for those balls. And as soon as they start doing that, that's when I can transition into the wall is home, right? So even if it goes, you know, obviously the goal is to get to the net as soon as possible, but even if they don't, I feel like, and from the tennis part of it, moving a player back and forward and creating some angles and and knowing that the pickleball doesn't bounce as far, uh, I think that's a huge advantage for, for me. And obviously it's not really a secret, it's just the way of what I discovered, uh, first of all. Uh, you know, ball is and whatever, um, the margins are ever, errors there. Um, Yes, I mean, it's a pickleball, right? So the pickleball is light, the, a little wind gust comes around. But, you know, there, I think, you know, when you have the opportunity in, in shutting the door on your opponent with volleys, you have to go for a little bit more and not just think the ball over. That is probably the time then, if I'm safe from the baseline to leading up to that shot, when I get my volley shot, I'm really trying to put it away so the ball doesn't come back or at least if it does come back it will be an even easier next shot for me yeah i mean i i'm not sure of this this answer but i mean in tennis there's a big difference on specialization of you know doubles and singles although i mean i noticed in doubles the way it used to be played and where it's now played it's a little bit more of a baseline game in doubles than it used to be but in pickleball do you think the shots are different enough that they're has to become a specialization in either uh singles and doubles because they're going to get so good on either side 
Yeah, so I mean, yes, because the difference between the two games are so much more than in tennis. But if, as, as you said, you know, tennis now again, you know, who would have thought that baselines, you know, a lot of times in tennis too it happens because people are hitting the ball too hard. You really need to be good at it. Um, but, you know, yes, I mean, you would think so. I, I think, you know, if you're a doubles player from the beginning, I don't think you can be a tennis, I mean, a singles player. Uh, but if you're a singles player and work hard, at least you have a shot at, at being a decent doubles player. But would you be able to dominate both sides, right? The singles and doubles be number one in both. I, I don't see that happening. And I think, you know, what, uh, you know, Ben Johns has been doing you know, in all three disciplines is, you know, obviously fantastic, incredible. But I don't think that will, will last, you know, for... Uh, forever uh, i think you know even next year i think there will be one discipline that uh, probably will uh, he will have a little bit more difficult and i think that will be singles and that's be my prediction uh doubles and mix you know he's sitting pretty pretty in those disciplines but i is saying that as an example that you know it will be specialized as well. I mean, it's just the way more and more better players come in, better athletes comes in, more and more tennis player, um, other countries comes in, uh, you know, starting putting together what happens in in Sweden during the 80s with tennis, in Spain during the 90s and in the early 2000s, you know, um, you know, where they just produce top players after top players. And that, that will happen in pickleball too, for sure. Yeah, I mean... You know, Sweden is one of those com uh, countries that produced so many champions over the years. I mean, I don't know much about the systems that were employed there in terms of player development. I get the question asked about pickleball because there's not a lot of player development happening there. What can we learn about the environment you came up with in player development? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, in... In Sweden during those 80s, we had for a while, we had the six guys in the top 10 in the world. Uh, we had, I think, 14, 15 players in the top 100. Uh, so, and the system there was uh, all the clubs, uh, you know, the, the system was based on that. Yes, yeah, so you got free training, you got free coaching, you got all this free, but you're also expected to give back to the uh, the younger people under you. So if I was 14, I expected to teach a couple of hours a week to the eight-year-old. And then when I got 16, then, well, you're going to teach a 14-year-old, right? So the whole step progress, and that keeps everybody, you know, in order to get something, you give something. And uh, that system was very, very, uh, you know... <laughs> I really like the system. You know, a lot of volunteer work was, was involved with, but I think, you know, society changed, other sports came up, and, you know, I don't have time to volunteer to do this, you know, I want to practice instead, and though I wouldn't call it greed, but uh, something changed, and I think that's the model in Sweden after that fell through completely, and that's Number one, I think we maybe thought it would be going on forever, that we're just going to keep producing. And all of a sudden, other countries maybe cop a little bit what we did, and they got better. And at the same time, the interest level of volunteering and helping others disappear uh, in, in Swedish tennis. And that's why we have had a bigger struggle uh, for the last 10, 20 years, actually, more, more or less. Yeah. And I, I know that now you, you went from coaching a lot of tennis to also, you know, coaching a lot of pickleball. Um, how do you approach that? What's your mindset uh, when you help someone improve? Yeah, I think, you know, you, each person, you can never group everybody just because you have philosophy and saying this is how pickleball should be played. You cannot group all of them together and saying, okay, this is how we're going to play. You got to look at each individual skill set and see what... Um, she and or he and she can can do a potential is that the right technique for that person is that the the right style of play uh, and you try to tweak it i have my fundamentals that i really believe in when i'm teaching um yes because i know from a biomechanics standpoint that is actually the way it almost has to be done but you can still have tweaks to it as long as uh, it, it stays within certain parameters. Um, 
that that's you know my philosophy with it but again you you have to see each individual and not just the group everybody together i think that's the biggest part that uh, people maybe do a mistake yeah so it sounds like a lot of um trying things out and seeing what works yeah and, and i think after you've done that for so many years coming from tennis and doing a pickleball too it doesn't take me many minutes to assess somebody, right? A couple of minutes and you'll see each stroke a couple of times uh, and the bell rings on my head and saying, okay, this is what is done. And then we try it out. And then it's, uh, is that possible for that person to do? If it is, you, you add more to it. If it's not, you obviously have to rethink a little bit of strategy uh, with them and try to explain it in different ways. And Again, how you explain things, you know, visually, maybe people like to see it. Other people really want to hear it. And other people want to have a combination of the two or, uh, or, or other things, right? There's so many things that you can add on for a person to understand the concept that you're trying to uh, get to. Absolutely. Now, I know, you know, you, you are a big part of uh, senior pros and how that's going to develop going forward. Uh, I'm biased because four years from now, I want to join you there and and uh, join yeah. the fun. Uh, talk, you know, tell us about that, what you're doing and, and what the future looks like for Senior Pro. Yeah, first of all, you know, so we have the f future Senior Pro bracket. I don't know if you knew that. I did not know. What's, what's that bracket? That is the bracket from the 45 to 49 year old. Wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> so maybe that's something for you right there, right? There you go. I, I learned something new. Yeah, so we we decided to in, include that bracket um, only because, you know, in Pickleball, when you reach 40 plus, yes, you can compete with the regular pros, probably 40, 41, 42, but each year it gets tougher. And again, the, the way the game is going, it's going to be rare for a 40-year-old to compete with a 25-year-old. Uh, so everybody in Pickleball are always just waiting to turn 50 so they can play the senior pros. So why not create something they call the future senior pros, get them accustomed to, you know, the senior pro and they have their own division. We have some prize money for them as well when we do it. So, but just getting everybody on board in this special uh, bracket called future senior pros and hopefully you know, engage them early so everybody knows as soon as you take turn 50, that is when you're a regular senior pro, but you have probably played with all the other players in the same age group for many, many years already. But obviously, we'll be expanding to the 55 or 57 year old now in the regular senior pros at that time compared to when you started as a 45 year old. I see. So yeah. that's, yeah. That makes sense. You get time to build those rivalries. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. But the whole concept behind the senior pros, you know, this was just a little side note about the bracket per se. Uh, you know, we felt like the senior pros at a certain time last year, you know, it was, we have a very diminishing role in pickleball. And if you look at the age demographics, you know, 80% of people still are, you know, in the 40s and up to who plays pickleball. So there is a huge market there for us. And, you know, it, it's nothing, you know, all these young regular pros, they're fantastic uh, what they do. It's no doubt about that. But do they need to compete with core time with us or should we comp compete with core time with them or their price money? And a lot of people feel also they, all the people relate to what we can do, uh, the best senior pros, what we can do on the court, they can actually say, hmm, he can do it as a 52-year-old. I'm 50 myself. That should be possible for me to do. They cannot relate to necessarily to a 22-year-old because our bodies, you know, obviously cannot do what, what, what those youngsters, uh, you know, do. So that was another part of it that we kind of want to separate and just having where the senior pros are the focal point um in anything we, we get the streaming we get the price money it's only the for the right age demographics uh, and that's kind of the concept behind it awesome i love it well i'm a huge supporter and i'll do what i can help great great appreciate it i hope you see see you on one of the future senior pro brackets then i'll have to do my research oh actually i gotta i gotta drill more <laughs> yeah okay okay
<laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Matthias. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you around. Thanks for tuning in to the Alpha Pickleball Podcast with Tats. If you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe, rate, and connect with us on social media. Stay alpha on the pickleball court until our next session.